Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And there's a nice amount of sound on this. Can you hear me on the, some of you in the back? Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you, Pierre, for introducing the app, which, of course, is a very important part of our discussion today. Um, I know the feeling of sitting sort of in row five, and you lean back, and you find your reading material that you didn't manage yesterday, and you start reading. And then some, suddenly somebody says something up here, that you find really offensive or extremely bright, and you want to make a comment, and you didn't don't download the app, and now it's gone from the screen because somebody else is using the screen, and you feel really dumb. So please download the app now, because you will need it uh, when you get agitated. You might feel relaxed now. You just had coffee, and you don't want to take part in anything whatsoever because it got right sort of late last night but you will uh, feel the urge later on, I bet you. Uh, so download the app now, that would be my suggestion. And let me introduce the two question selectors. Pierre was very modest. Pierre is the head of Global Surface Technology with Total here in Copenhagen, uh, previously, of course, with uh, Mask Oil before it was merged with uh, Total. Uh, and his colleague as question selectors today, uh, Massimo Virgilio, is research director with Schlumberger, uh, based in Milano and, and Stavanger up in Norway. Uh, and, of course, the five speakers here will all address today's topic, the digitalization of the ENP industry. Um, and how do we go from here? What is the status? What is the roadmap ahead of us on this particular part of the developments within your industry? And that doesn't mean, of course, that we are out of uh, the very um, realistic scenarios that we were presented with yesterday. We're still in the era of transition, even though we have now decided to move somewhat into the nitty-gritty of everyday uh, work in the industry. So we are very much still in the era of transition. And you know, of course, already what the challenges of digitalization is. You all work with it on a daily basis. You know the hype, you know the scares, you know the potentials. Uh, but of course, the question now is how exactly one addresses this uh, if uh, one is bestowed with decision-making powers within the industry, as are all these five gentlemen. Uh, and I will introduce them as we go along. They will uh, be given five minutes each uh, for starters uh, to tell us how their organizations address the, the very pertinent issue of digitalization. Of course, this is a tool that all of them need to stay relevant in an era of transition, which already poses challenges. Uh, so this is a strategic uh, point uh, that uh, all of them deal with on a daily basis. And let me just give you the briefest of introductions now, and I will then introduce each of the speakers as they are given the floor. Uh, John Edgen is Distinguished Advisor uh, for Seismic Imaging with BP. Daryl Harris is Chief Geophysicist of Woodside. Um, Daryl is there. Uh, Francisco Ortugosa, Director of Geoscience Technology at Repsol. Michael Borrell, Senior Vice President, North Sea and Russia of Total. And Aslak Belani from... Uh, no, hold on. Yo, Ashok, you're there. Ashok Belani from Slomberger. Uh, Executive Vice President um, of Slomberger since 2011. So thank you, gentlemen, all of you, for being here. Uh, and let me finalize this by saying, yes, one more detail before we get started for real. This session is being streamed live, uh, which means that you're on television right now. Uh, it also means that there might be uh, participants who are not in this room, uh, and I'd like to say to all of them right now that you're most welcome uh, as um, participants in any respect, but also to ask questions. And you can do that just like the rest of the people here by using uh, the app. 
and send in your questions. And I would request that if you are not present in this room and you send in a question or your opinion or your, uh, your contribution in any way, please indicate where you are located just to give us a sense of uh, who we are with. Um, and I think that concludes um, our opening uh, remarks. And with that, I'll simply uh, ask you, uh, Mr. Etkin, to take uh, the, uh, the word. Uh, and I'll just add a few more words to your, uh, yourself. John Etkin worked uh, from 1990 at Amico Production Research Company in Oklahoma until 2011 as senior scientist and then senior scientific advisor for seismic imaging. He was then appointed distinguished advisor for seismic imaging with BP and still works within BP's upstream technology organization. And now you have approximately five minutes. All right, thank you very much. Ah, I see the mic is working, that's great. Uh, by chance, I think there should be uh, a slide presentation with my name on it. So this will be the first test to see if that works. Yeah, we will just have to wait. In the meantime, I'll add uh, my own thanks uh, and especially appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today and talk with you about this very important topic. Uh, the nice thing about uh, my perspective is, of course, Seismic was the original digital part of the industry. I think we went digital in about 1955, um, so we've been there a while. Although, actually, I think we probably shouldn't get too complacent because as I watch my colleagues in the various engineering disciplines now, they've made some remarkable strides in what they've been able to achieve. I see the slide still hasn't come up yet. Um, uh, so I just uh, continue to say that uh, you know, my company sees this not just as a way to stay relevant, but it's a way to stay competitive. Uh, in many ways, the barrels that you find by coming at a digital world and understanding how to optimize what you are doing are probably the cheapest barrels that you can find in your entire portfolio. So in a world of relatively common resources, uh, relatively abundant production, uh, in a world where if you are going to stay relevant and competitive, you have to be on the leading edge of that cost curve, uh, this is just an absolute imperative. There's no way to avoid playing this game. Um, you know, from my perspective, I work primarily with people doing uh, seismic exploration, so we do, we do a lot with automatic interpretation, things like that. Uh, but in addition, we have some very big efforts in optimizing field production. And ultimately, we are looking forward to the day where actually many decisions that are human-driven now um, actually will have a very large component of machine-driven in the future. Um, so I'm kind of giving you a summary of what should have been on the slide. There we go. So that's a, you know, a quick preview of kind of what we're up to in BP. And maybe I won't extend my remarks a lot beyond that. Uh, it, it is so important to us that we actually coined a term for it. You'll see that term, the connected upstream. Uh, it's certainly our intention to be leaders in this area, as I'm sure that's true for many of my colleagues here as well. Uh, so I look forward to the discussion and your questions. And uh, with that, I guess I will leave it there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, John. Um, and let me just, if, if somebody got confused from the program, perhaps I should clarify that uh, John Edkin traveled with a very, very short notice uh, in replacement of somebody else who had uh, said that he would be here, Ahmed Hashmi, who Ahmed was... Ahmed Hashmi is my boss, um, and he was unable to travel. Yeah. Um, it turns out I was going to be in Europe this week anyway, so it actually wasn't that big of a Oh, so, that was nice. Uh, yep, so absolutely, so uh, absolutely a pleasure to be here. And John, let me ask you one follow-up question before we move on, because before we came in here, you told me that in Houston, you're about 5,000 people. Yes. Would you make an estimate as to how many of the 5,000 are involved in the, let's say, the development of digitalization of your organization? So I guess it depends on where you draw the line. I mean, if you talk about people who are real machine learning experts, computer scientists, um, that number is actually not a huge number. It's probably in the, you know, kind of multi-tens, so maybe 50 people. Um, but when you look at all the people that they touch fairly directly in terms of field engineers, process engineers, petroleum engineers, reservoir engineers, geoscientists, you know, that number is probably 2,500. That's very interesting because you might 
I mean, from outside, when you hear the word digitalization, and you hear a huge organization that already back in 1995 started working with big data in a sense, mm -hmm. then you would assume that putting that into the machinery, the software, etc., would be a lot of people. And now you say it's only in the tens. So basically, the people who do the digitalization are not computer nerds themselves, but they have to deal with it, they have to live it, they have the, to execute it. The multi-tens of them are kind of the hardcore computer nerds. They, they do, in fact, uh, do the hardcore hands-on coding. Uh, and they end up working with a very broad cross-section of our technical staff. Exactly. But my point here really is that it's basically um, half of the people in Houston deal with this increase in computer capacity, big data analysis on a daily basis. Yep, absolutely. Interesting. Thank you very much for these uh, introductory remarks. Um, Ashak Bilani is responsible for Slumberger's research, engineering, manufacturing, technology, life cycle management, software technology, and information technology. And I expect you to remember all of that. <laughs> No, Mr. Bilami, of course, has a, a, a very long and um, distinguished career. Uh, started as a field engineer with Schlumberger in 1980. Uh, between 2000 and 2004, Mr. Bilani managed Schlumberger's semiconductor equipment business in California. And he asked me to leave it at that. I could have gone on for about an hour. I won't. Mr. Bilani, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, good morning, everyone. I, it, how are we going to do this? I keep asking you to flick the slide. Or, okay, so uh, maybe I'll take a slightly different tack from how John positioned um, the industry. I think the fact that the industry works with uh, data or with computers, and if you call working with data and computers as being digital, uh, yes, we've been doing it for a long period of time. We've been using large amounts of data for a long period of time. However, what is true, and I think we should be humble a little bit, uh, there are developments that have happened in the last 15 years, let's say, which have brought uh, new capabilities, which uh, I think underscore the word in the title of this, talk, this uh, session, which is digitalization of the ENP industry. And this digitalization actually does mean something different quite substantially different from what digital has been in the oil and gas business in the past. You know. So I think the facts are that, yes, we've worked with a lot of data, but uh, the facts are that we don't work with a lot of data all the time, if you like. Uh, we should be able to work with uh, all of the data in the North Sea 100% of the time, but we don't do that. Each one of uh, the people sitting here who are geoscientists are working with a maximum of uh, a number like, say, 30 gigabytes of uh, stacked data at any one time, whereas they should be able to work with like a terabyte of data, which should cover like thousands of blocks as opposed to the block that you are interested in at that particular period of time. And if you did have the capability of working on all of that data together, then uh, you would be a lot more efficient in the way you turn out the results, or you'd be able to uh, try out many th things that you're not able to try out today because it takes time to be able to load the right amount of data for the right applications, and the data is loaded based on particular applications, and that's not the way the industry is going to function in the future. So in the future, I think, as said on the slide, that there are all of these changing digital capabilities which will allow us to innovate in the way we work, and innovating the way we work ha does bring in these aspects of uh, we'll be able to work better, we'll be able to work cheaper, we'll be able to work a lot faster. Faster meaning that we would, our performance in terms of uh, more with less resources and be able to work uh, more expediently would go up. Now, what is a fact is that as computing has increased in the 80s or the 90s, yes, this faster, cheaper, better g keeps on going in that direction. But in the last decade, the kind of digital technologies or capabilities that have come about because of 
all the digital uh, developments that have come out of the world of high tech, they do have a significance in our industry as well, and it's going to change the way the industry works. Change slide, please. So, I think the the interesting thing here is that in the past, go ahead and fill this slide. Uh, in the past, most of our work with data has come from there is an application, we want to actually perform a certain task. For that application, we need some engines and stuff, uh, and um, algorithms, let's say. And for th those algorithms or engines are applied on a certain amount of data. When we want to perform that particular task, we put together the data that go into that particular task and we perform that, ap that, that task. Well, in the future, life will be a lot more uh, different in the sense that those layers will get a uh, little bit separated from each other, so that if the data is brought into the right kind of store, then all data, doesn't matter whether it's seismic or it is uh, financial or it is logistics, all of that data will be available all the time to all applications. So there is a data layer which is completely separate, it's available to all applications all the time. Then you separate the engines or the machine learning algorithms or, or networks or whatever the engines might be. Those engines are also available all the time, sometimes working in the background. And then the application layers are basically interfaces of humans to this system, and this system is serving up to people the, the data through the engines that are uh, spread in a nice way. So the workflows get tied together in a completely different way than they were in the past, and that brings about new capabilities in the future. So the purpose of uh, demonstrating this, I, I just would maybe show a couple of examples. Can we switch? So here in this case, there is a, a small amount of data that is uh, training the, the machine to be able to pick uh, faults or, or make a tectonic framework. Uh, and you see that in 30 seconds, it produces some results. In one minute, it produces um, better results. And over a period of minutes, it's able to actually take a pretty large data set with a small training uh, um, subset and be able to actually spread that over a large uh, set. Uh, go ahead. Here, here is another case of salt interpretation where we are uh, training the, the, the manual interpretation gives that result. This is a result that came out of a network and uh, the quality shows the blue is, is where the tops have been picked correctly. And uh, we are only picking with the artificial intelligence the tops in this case, so the tops are well, well uh, shown by the light blue, which shows that it's very high quality. And what is being done over here, in this particular case, so over a small block, can be spread over a much larger data set uh, automatically, so if what would have taken uh, a set of hum a, a group of humans or let's say one particular interpreter say weeks to do in the past can be done in minutes uh, after training them on a certain data set. And I'm, I'm not saying, the, all, all, that, all that I'm saying here is not rocket science. I think probably all the companies around the panel are, are doing this kind of work today. But the fact is that when data is available in the right kind of data store, then these kind of networks are possible to set up. And these kind of networks can make the subsurface interpreter a lot more efficient and a lot more performant in the future. Go ahead. So for the, so the purpose of this discussion, all I wanted to bring was one little key point in this aspect of digitalization. And, uh, and uh, this is a case where we've spread it over a large data set. Here's a, another example of stratigraphy being done in the same way. Let's just switch. I don't want to take too much time. I just want to go to the conclusion that uh, I take one particular aspect of digitalization which is machine learning, and I put that in the word of artificial intelligence, that it can impact the oil and gas industry today, making us a lot more performant. Seismic processing and interpretation will pro progress or evolve rapidly using all of these digital capabilities in the future. We should be able to boost uh, performance of exploration teams uh, by better and faster and cheaper digital capabilities. 
And if we do go about changing our workflows, then we will be able to achieve a lot more with a lot less resources in the future. And I'll leave it, leave it, leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Bellani. I, I think we should give him a hand. And let's give Mr. Edgin a hand as well. I mean, we forgot that. Thank you very much. <laughs> And, and, and just one clarification here uh, before we move on, and I think we should get back to this point uh, a little later. Um, you talk of the application of artificial intelligence, and, and we heard a lot about that yesterday as well. Uh, but the application of intelli artificial intelligence, uh, does that differ in your mind from going digital in a new way? I mean, when do you differentiate between artificial intelligence and simply uh, dealing with more big data? Well, I, I think artificial intelligence is just one subject in the whole digital world. Um, there are There's aspects of big data and analytics that don't necessarily get called artificial intelligence or high performance computing, which makes all of this possible. These are all components of, let's say, the digital world. There is cloud technologies which allow you to scale in different ways. There are collaborative technologies which come from digital, which help you do things in a certain other way. There are real-time capabilities that keep your systems alive all the time by spreading the right analytics and machine learning in the right stack of technology. All of this is digital capability, if you like, and artificial intelligence is one subject uh, which is involved. With the, the reason I asked you was because John Etkin uh, mentioned very briefly um, the decision-making which of course is now the crucial issue. Is, is, is there certain levels of decision making where digitalization is already sort of um, worming its way into the decision making process? Data stacking, data uh, computing of course is one issue, uh, but when it, when it becomes a decision making process, that is where the, the, the computers really do make a difference. That's where they become really crucial. Right. So you could tie all of that together in the idea that when you put together a set of these digital technologies in the right stack, then you can go up the path of automation. And you could go all the way to automation where the machine does most of the work and you do less of the actual and you leave yourself decision making or the high level interpretation. So it's where on the path of automation you are, yes. which, uh, which determines how automated you are basically. Right? Yeah, I do. would you say there are already decisions that let's say are being made redundant or not necessary because the computing is already a decision making process? In, in this case, the computing is an enabler. The computing is at the level of infrastructure where it is, it is performing the task uh, totally seamless to the user. Uh, and the, the software stack takes care of how that, that uh, processing is being done. And the workflow or the way it is strung together helps you go up the path of automation over time, if you like. Yeah. And the word there, seamless, of course, is what we all dream it would be. Because it never is, is it? I mean, the wire is always missing somewhere. Well, certainly you can, you can imagine that uh, today a particular operat operator is directing pretty much every part of the task that happens. And in the future, the system will perform the task and serve up to the user what the user needs for his own function, if you like, which is quite different. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ashap Gilani, thank you very much for now. We'll come back. Uh, Daryl Harris is the chief uh, geophysicist with Woodside and flew in, I believe, from Perth. Yes. Now, I, we should have a minute's silence here. No. <laughs> but thank you very much for being here. Uh, Daryl is wonderful. Perth is, uh, is far away from Copenhagen, so thank you for, for coming all this way. Uh, Daryl joined Woodside in 93, moved to, in 2001 to Saravac Shell in Malaysia, and then back to Woodside in Australia in 2008, eventually into leadership roles in geosequestration and brownfield development. From 2011, Head of Development Geoscience, and then Chief Geophysicist in 2013, also leads Woodside's Subsurface Functional Excellence Group. 
So it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. So firstly, I'd like to, uh, to thank the EAG for the invitation, and I, I'm pleased to be here to be able to learn from my colleagues and share Woodside's experience. Uh, if you could stay on the previous slide, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, and I suppose just as I was doing, uh, doing some final preparation for this last night, um, through a bit of a haze of jet lag, I, I realised that uh, one, of the, one of the larger benefits of, of digitisation is that I'm not sure that there's such a thing as bit lag. Um, it, uh, when, you, when you're tired and you're trying to concentrate, machines don't have the problem of being tired and trying to concentrate, but people do. So, so I'll probably approach this from a little, a little bit of a more of a people aspect. But obviously, Perth's a long way from Copenhagen, and I, I suppose you could go to New Zealand if you wanted to get further away. But, but that's uh, not much. So I was, I was, uh, it was three o'clock in the morning my time trying to do a little bit of extra preparation for this last night. So if we have a look at the uh, the next slide. Uh, so so what does digitisation bring to us as Woodside views it? Woodside's been on this journey for a number of years now. We've been working with a number of different partners, uh, a wide variety of partners actually, trying to, trying to capture a, a, as much of the information that's out there as we possibly can. And I think from our point of view, what we see it as is a collective intelligence. So... Um, if we have access to all of the data, all of our history, all of our experience, all at once, th then we bring to the party a collective intelligence. A and that enables you to be data-driven. It enables you to, to talk about um, show me rather than tell me when you're making decisions. And it, it really gets you away from some of the pre or misconceptions that are built up over the over the period of a person's experiential life uh, where they may have had a limited experience or a biased experience and they've built up pre or misconceptions but n now you're in a world where f for decision making purposes it's all about show me show me the data that supports what we're doing and I think that's just a huge benefit to making better decisions in the ENP industry in every aspect of what we do. Um, and if you think about what we do, everything we do is an algorithm. Um, we just get humans to do it because sometimes they're really complex algorithms. And we know from a, a, a lot of the, uh, the, um, the data and the literature that's out there that the best results come from humans and machines working together. The machines doing the tedious work and the humans doing maybe more of the creative work. So we see um, that that digitisation in the ENP industry provides us with a huge platform for innovation. It really does allow us to, to get access to the data, to search the data, to ask those questions. Um, and you can get people from the entire business to, to, to participate in, in this digitisation of the ENP industry. If you just go to the next slide. So one of the things that, that Woodside is pushing reasonably hard is, is the development of citizen data scientists. So we have a, uh, a diverse community of employees from, from very experienced to inexperienced. Woodside's been in a slightly enviable position or counter-cyclic position in that we've been hiring sort of 3% um, graduates or 100 graduates a year for the last four or five years. We've got some really clever young, uh, young people into the organisation. So how do we make the best use of those people and the best use of the people that have seen a lot in their lifetime and experienced a lot. So, so we provide internally a, a number of online training courses to allow people to have access to the, to the data, to the tools, to have the creative ideas, to, to think about what questions they might want to ask, and then they can interrogate the data. So um, I think, as we've always said, there, there's no stupid question. So, so you can ask whatever question you want, and any question you ask might prompt uh, a spark in someone else's mind that might provide uh, a, a catalyst to a real innovation that adds some real value to the organisation. So that's just one of the focus areas for us, and I'll look forward to the rest of this discussion today and uh, to learn a bit more from my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Um, and thank you again for, for traveling. Um, you say that humans and computers together is the best way to look at this. Uh, the most creative work should be left to the human factor here. 
Isn't that a somewhat, I, 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 I sympathize as a human with the, with the idea that something should be left for us to do. Um, but somehow I also sense a reluctance to really allow for the computing power to play its full potential role. So I think in terms of that, so so if we if we take the example that Ashok just presented, where you're interpreting some some seismic data, so what what the human might be able to bring to that is a model or an idea of a number of models or the different the diverse number of models, and then the computer can match those models to the data. So um, I'm not sure we're yet at the stage of the computer being able to to conceive of all of those different models of the subsurface uh, on its own merits before interrogating the data to try and decide which one of these models the data best fits or supports. Um, this, of course, is a crucial way of, of a, a crucial crossroads here, how we think uh, the, uh, the potential collaborative process between the most creative minds and the most creative machine, so to speak, in the ENP industry. And, and where does creativity begin and stop? Uh, so I urge you all to add your voice uh, to this discussion through the app and send your questions or comments uh, to our question selectors uh, also on this particular topic. I, I, I start to think of this discussion as somewhat a, a three or four uh, pillars, where, where one, of course, is the, the, the question of technology. Do we have the right technology? Do we develop the right technology? Is it, is it a sound way of looking at an organization to have only uh, 50 out of 5,000 people who are really tech nerds? If I may be interpreting you wrong. You will get the floor in a minute. Uh, but or, or should half the, the, the population of an EMP company really be employed in developing technology at a, at a much faster rate? That's one issue. And then, as, as Dale just said, the organization, the way we look at this, of course, is humanly, uh, or humongously important. You have now a, a program called Citizens Data Scientist, and you just explained how that works. Uh, I'm sure we'll get back to that. The way the organization is done here is, is really crucial uh, to how we embrace the technology. Because if we just keep running up and down the same office floors and, and doing what we used to do yesterday, uh, it doesn't really matter with all these new machines. Uh, and then, of course, in the, in the last uh, pillar, or the second last, of course, is the question of who do we engage in all this, the human factor. Is that fact of the same old people we had yesterday, or do we have to chuck out half of the staff and get some really bright people in there? Um, that's another option, of course, that digitalization is really challenging um, the organizations with. Uh, and then, I don't know if artificial intelligence is a pillar on itself here, or whether it's integrated in, in, in our talks about technology, but I think artificial intelligence is somewhat more than, intel uh, than, than technology. Um, but um, let's keep that in mind, and please use your app as we go along. I know this is a long way of starting a debate, but, but you have your app and you can use it at any time. Friend, sorry? Could we have the code back on? on, on f yes, please, thank you. And uh, I don't think the code is there. That one, I think. Yeah, right. That's the stuff you always forget. Another way of doing it is taking a picture of it, then you can remember it <laughs> Christmas. Mr. Ortigoza, Francisco Ortigoza is Director of Geoscience Technology at Repsol, as I already said, has been in the business for more than 30 years, uh, very much engaged in the digital transformation uh, in the ENP business. Uh, Mr. Ortigoza served, um, uh, has got several awards from the Repsol's Kaleidoscope project using computer chips to locate reservoirs without drilling. Uh, I learned that, and also Platts awarded Francisco the Technology of the Year Award for his efforts in this regard. So here's a real expert. Sorry, gentlemen, um, <laughs> another real expert. Uh, Mr. Ortigosa, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I don't know what is coming in this bill. Uh, it's not the one I sent, anyway. We, we don't find chips without, we don't find out without uh, drilling. 
So then I want to be a little bit innovative, and I want to, to present my five minutes from the, from the floor, OK? Please. So first of all, I think I need the, the device. Is this one? The, this is which one? Is, uh, yeah, OK. So first of all, it's not working. Okay. First of all, I would like to make like three three kind of thoughts, which are a little bit different from the regular thoughts that we have when we talk about the digital transformation. And then two videos. One is one minute, and the other is like uh, 30 seconds. Okay. This is the typical uh, cash flow profile of um, of all the oil field. All of the projects in upstream, or any project, you will see that there is a period with the negative cash flow, and then we have the, the first oil, and then we start having, having positive cash flow. You can imagine that, the, that the, the, how many, you already know how many years in the horizontal axis and how many billion dollars in the vertical axis. So if I'm the president of my company, I would say, hey, what I need, why I need technology? What I need is fiscal lawyers. Hey, look at all of this chunk of green thing. Well, anyway, if we want to really think what is one of the role of technology that we can say we can significantly improve, or they say significantly, significantly improve the MPV of the project, definitely is to shorten the time between the, the when we, there is a, we pick up an area to the first oil. So the, imp, the potential impact of, of shortening this time by making faster seismic acquisition, faster processing, faster interpretation, faster reservoir simulation, faster drilling, if we can shorten significantly this period of time, the impact could be billions, but not billions like this, like billions like this. It's a, it's a significant impact on the MPV of the project. And this is one of the things that, that that will be bringing, now, bringing the digitalization. So now the, the next slide, this is one consideration. Another thing is that I'm not going to tell you what is the digital transformation because you already know. Everybody has seen all of these stages. Only can, I would like you to ask you this question. How many in the audience have Windows phones? Hey, nobody. Okay, how many in the audience is using the Bing uh, uh, search engine? Okay, one person, two person. You know why these kind of tools, why everybody is using mostly other, other iPhones which are no Windows, why? Because, because, it's because of a technical reason? Is because of an investment reason? No, it's because people don't like it. The main reason why the digital transformation will, will succeed in a product or in a company or something is because you change the experience of the user or your client. People like Uber because change their lives. People like iPhone. I already remember that time I was at home 27 Seven, I was watching TV and I saw this black device and one finger going through the artwork. And I said, my goodness, I want this thing. Because that was the iPhone. So everybody is want, is want everything that will change their experience. So, and then because uh, uh, something, this, this, they will change their experience because all of this new uh, digital usage will bring new type of innovation and creativity. How many new things you can do with your smartphone that you were not able to do 10 years ago? Many. So this is what we think in our company. So we really want to change the experience of the end user of the, of the, of the interpreter. And the experience is, you know what? Literally, learn a little bit more. You are going to have the experience of a, of a, of a specialist. So you that are an interpreter, you are a geologist, you will be learning a little bit more, and through the digitalization, you will have the experience of being uh, an specialist of these people that there are only a couple of guys, 10 guys somewhere. So let's, let's slide. This is another consideration. This is from Richard Cooper, my friend Richard Cooper and Anthony Kiria. So. 
Have you realized that in all the specialities that we do in geophysics mainly and, and this thing, so we are, we are doing quantitative uh, things, we like accuracy, we like precision, and then suddenly, once we, we, we have a product, once we have something that's deliverable, it's completely going to, let's say, the, 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 the users, and, and most of the decisions, and most, most of these people, they will be doing a quality decision based on qualitative issues. So we really need to empower these people. We really need to give them tools. We really need to, to have these tools to, to turn the, the job, as they say, the, 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 you, we need the machines to do the, the tedious work. So they can be empowered, and then the decisions can be made in a, in a quantitative uh, environment. Okay, next slide. This is what we really want to do in, in the company by, by changing the experience, by giving them uh, uh, this tool. So next slide is a video. Oh, no. So the, the enabler for all of this that I'm saying definitely is the cloud. Because now through the cloud we can do things that we never even imagined like, 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 like five years ago, not even then, five years. Okay, let's go to the video. Houston, Texas, Repsol's North American headquarters. Over the last few years, the company's geophysics department has developed 27 applications for ENP that use supercomputing technologies. Until now, they could only be accessed through this building's supercomputing infrastructure. Only 12 specialists interacted with this type of technology. Digital transformation has allowed us to combine supercomputing and the cloud. And Repsol was able to overcome certain complexities to become, once again, pioneers in the industry. From now on, the GNG team of more than 500 professionals will be able to work from anywhere in the world. They will only need a tablet like this and an internet connection. How have we achieved it? By deploying our applications in the cloud. The amazing technical and technological work developed by our professionals in collaboration with Microsoft has opened up a world of possibilities. Accessibility, team interaction, innovation, synchronization of projects, technological democratization. This is how the Repsol Geophysics area is working today. So look at this. Look at this revolution. Revolution is not only that the people could be accessing this technology that requires high performance computing from the office. It can be accessed from your home. It can be accessed from a hotel. It can be accessed anywhere in the world with, an, with, a, with a tablet. What, what about the, colla the collaboration of these people traveling? In, in, I mean, it's unbelievable. So next slide. So what kind of, of tools we are going to, to deploy? This is, this is a sesame cube that is auto-interpreting itself without any human uh, intervention. Why is it not playing? OK. No, it's playing here, but not there. Hmm. Now, this is the last. No, what you, no, it's playing here, but not in the... No, it was playing when you are in presenting mode or in presentation mode. So you know the old saying, never share the stage with children or animals. Now we need to say, and AI. <laughs> <laughs>
No, you have to clean. Yeah. Now. Now that's a cliffhanger. It's interesting. He was playing before. It's a 30 second video, believe me. <laughs> that was the problem. <laughs> I see Slumberjay developed a technology to sabotage Repsol's technology. <laughs> Yeah, there's a... So this is one of the things that, I mean, we, it's very important to empower the people, to empower the users. Yeah, that's very thought-provoking, you know? It's like, like uh, what's his name from... from uh, to the last. From Apple when he's when he was introducing one of these new telephones on stage and it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, eight. Yes. Click. Oh yes, here it goes. Here it goes. Here we go. So you will see. You see this. Okay, this is a person is moving the cube. And then, okay, it has interpreted automatically 531 volts. 531 volts. We are displaying only 23. The, co the, color, the color bar is depth. It's not voxels. It's real SYC data. ASCII data, you can grid. It's gridable. So now you will see that the cube is undoing the faulting. It's restoring the geology. You will see now, you see, they are flattened. They have undone the full default movement completely. So now, if you see the difference in the amplitudes, it's because you are looking at the at the horizon slices. Okay. So now, if you take a look uh, here. You see these faulted horizons. You see they are faulted. Hey, they are undone. So you have removed completely the 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 deformation now. They are, are coming the horizons. So we have, it has been interpreted automatically 90 horizons. This is one. It's the color code is the, is the depth. This is SYC data. It's readable. It can be mapped. It can be exported. You can extract the amplitudes. You can extract the amplitudes. You can do everything. So now you will see they are coming another horizon. This is the first. And then you see all of the rest of the horizons. Okay, they are not the 91 because if you display the 90 horizons, you cannot see anything. How long has taken this cube to be auto-interpreted, self-interpreted, without any human intervention at all? You just take the Segway cube, you put in the computer, you have a parameter file, you fill out the parameters, you hit enter, less than five minutes. Less than five minutes. So this is the kind of things that we'll be deploying in the cloud uh, to, to, be, to accelerate the business cycle, to empower our, our people, to give them not working uh, not spending time and time-consuming things, but in real creativity, in real, uh, in real uh, creativity things and innovation, and at the same time, the company will benefit that instead of having 12 specialists, we'll have more than 500. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you very much. Um, fascinating. Um, and I have one question in particular. When you showed us how you moved into the cloud, uh, I was immediately thinking, and you, you talk about people traveling, being able to work from home, and, and still having access to all of this data. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, 
it just dawned on me, our intelligence in this country, not the, the brains, but the people who work in the military intelligence, they tell us that the greatest threat to the country of Denmark at this stage in time is cyber attacks mm -hmm. of any sorts. And we're not talking of who is doing what, we're simply talking of the fact that hacking, uh, cyber attacks, um, the, the, the entrance into systems that were previously completely watertight is now the biggest threat uh, to this nation. So I just thought, how do you deal with this particular challenge of keeping your data to yourself, unharmed, undamaged by potential okay. attacks? So this example that you see running a tablet is being executed in San Antonio, Texas, in a supercomputer. We are accessing it from the woodlands. The, the, the latency is only 11 milliseconds. That's why you can see real time. After doing this, we can move everything to Dublin, and then we can, it can be accessed from our Madrid office. And all of this is inside our VPN. That means that, that in addition to the security that Microsoft is having for the system, which I guess would be very good. We have, on top of that, the security that we have for ourselves, because it's inside our VPN. Right. Our infrastructure people, they have been working very hard with Microsoft to be able to do this. So what they can say that is, are we not safe with doing this thing? Look at this. We are at least the same safety that we had previously, because right, it's inside right. the end. And on top of that, we have added the security from Microsoft. Right. And I, I think this is the beauty of the session, really, is that we're here to pool our knowledge. Uh, and and I, th I think we all realize that, that safety, the data safety, of course, is a, is a huge issue. You, you never talk about it, but this is really something that could kill your organization. I, I agree, for instance, that, that let's suppose, let's, I mean, everything that is coming with, with the data transformation, cybersecurity is a very big part of it. Just imagine, imagine your fields, your refineries, with thousands of IoT devices. Every IoT device is a point that can be hacked. Yeah. Every point. So you said, okay, we are going to be able to be very smart, take real-time decisions, but you know what? Every point that you are having for doing that, you are open a door to a cyber, cyber terrorist. Exactly, exactly. And I, and I thought just as you were saying, now we move it into the cloud, I don't know whether that makes it less secure than having it stored in, in, in big chunks of machinery. It's not. It's not. It's not. No, I, I thought not. Then everybody wouldn't be doing it. Um, and you feel that, that the safety system you have set up now is obviously just as, as, um, as secure as it was before. And then I just wonder, you, you talked very much about the, the, the speed and the expediency, the efficiency of your organization. Obviously, this is where uh, the profitability of the organization is also helped by digitalization. Uh, is there an increase as, as the speed of your data processing increases the, the, the massive amounts of data that is sh shoved from one place to another in, in no time, does that increase the risk of data loss, data, uh, uh, let's say, a, a leak or, or a hole that other people can access? Well, uh, I'm not going to tell you what kind of things we do with <laughs> our data, okay, to be safe. But what I'm telling you is that you really need to have very strong protocols to protect the data. And believe me, uh, you would be very, very, uh, you would be amazed that it doesn't matter how many uh, protocols you have to do it, and then suddenly the leak is because somebody is having a USB drive. <laughs> this is unbelievable. So, so, so for instance, it's true that you have to be very careful uh, to, to have very, very big protocols and very strong protocols to, to uh, uh, 
to have your data safe. But if you want to save big volumes of data, there are systems that they are encrypted, that you can do it safely, that you can take data. Yeah. And if you are moving data through the network, again, there are, they are in place, there are safety uh, uh, procedures. procedures. Yeah. And, and this, of course, definitely, is... Definitely, every time will be increasing because you never know who is going to be watching you. No, exactly. And I mean, this raises some fairly uncomfortable questions also of human resources and who do you recruit and, and what kind of procedures do you imply, apply when you recruit new people? I mean, y y some of you come from very, very large organizations. You have thousands of people who come in and out the door every year. So what kind of uh, safety procedures do you apply when you look at, at, a, at an environment where data security is really key to success and potential failure? I mean, we have a very large uh, shipping agency here in Copenhagen. They used to own an oil company as well, Maersk, uh, and they were downed for several days last year. They couldn't move one, one container safely to another point because their data system were invaded, not because they were targeted, because they were just victims of some random attack on a hospital in Ukraine. I won't go into the details, but the losses were counted in billions. Um, so so the, the potential for, for damage here is, is really uh, large. But perhaps we can come back to that. And again, I urge you to use the app and, and add your voice to this particular uh, discussion of, of data security. Uh, let's on, move on to Michael Borrell, uh, Senior Vice President, North Sea and Russia of Total. Uh, Michael joined Total in 1985, and from 1995 he held senior management positions uh, from 2003 in Indonesia, then President and CEO of Total ENP in Canada, then Vice President of the Caspian Area and Central Asia, and later Senior Vice President Europe and Central Asia. And then last year, in September, into his current position, as I said, as Senior Vice President North Sea and Russia. And if you were in doubt, that also means the UK, Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands, and we're very happy that Michael moved very recently to Copenhagen. So welcome in uh, both respects, and uh, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, perhaps just start with a, a quick apology. I'm the one imposter on the forum today. Uh, I'm not a geoscientist. I'm not a technology expert. Um, I've worked, I think, for the last 30 years in a technology-based industry, and so I do have some basis for my comments, uh, but I'm expecting to learn a lot in the discussion from my esteemed colleagues here uh, this morning. So you mentioned Maersk, and that's perhaps the right place to start. I'm, I, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, we saw this as a key event for us when we looked at 2018. Uh, you mentioned the acquisition of Mer Maersk. We completed the acquisition on the 8th of Arch and I moved over uh, immediately then, so I'm impressed some of you have come so far. I hopped in a taxi this morning that I ordered on my app uh, as part of my digital uh, uh, start to the day. However, I've stuck th after that as a, an old analog guy with a few pieces of paper and I don't have any slides. Um, but let me just put this into context because we're talking about... I you're being hacked. <laughs> Oh. Do you want me to shout? Is that what you wanted me to do? No, oh, I think it's better now. Good. Thank you. Can you hear me? Excellent. Have you got the code for the app to ask the questions about what I just said that you didn't hear? <laughs> Good. So let me just also start with a few numbers. We, we, are, we were asked to frame digitalization uh, and the transformation in EMP industry. T just a few figures for us, because I think it's important to... Uh, to frame this correctly when we talk about the EMP industry. Um, so we as an organization, we spend, I don't know, $15 billion a year, something like that, on investments. Our, e our research and development budget worldwide is about a billion dollars a year. In exploration production, it's about a third of that. Uh, and we spend about 10% of that specifically on digital, which doesn't seem very much when I was trying to put this into context. But in fact, when you look at it, and I take my colleagues here, it's probably more like a third of that EMP budget because when I take into account all of the geosciences work um, and the computing power that we put in place, 
it's more like a third of that. But it's, it's an important area for us. We as an organization, much like most of us here, I suspect, saw digital and transformation as something that was important to us. And, and I'll talk perhaps more about the transformation part of it than I worry about the digital. And we put in place a specific organization in, in 2015. And why is the transformation part of it important? I mean, I think, um, Francisco, you made some comments about how our lives have changed and how many people used iPhones or the Windows phones. You can see in our personal lives how things have changed in the way we work and the way we deal with the interface of, with the digital world. And, and it's all about that for us. Uh, and I think the reason why I'm here is to talk about digital is it's simply for us an enabler but a very important enabler. It's all about our operations being more efficient, being safer, having a better performance, and ultimately working at lower cost and generating profit for us. That's what we're about as an organization. That's what we're about as an industry, and that's where it comes down to how you can astutely use digital and have the right interfaces. There's another part to it. We talked about it yesterday in the opening session about the longevity of our industry and our organizations going forward and some of the challenges. We need to attract new people into our organization, into our industry. And digital is the way that, I look at my sons, I have three sons, two of them in fact, one of them's a, I think we called them computer geek or a, or a nerd indeed, I think he's a computer, a computer coder, uh, is, what, is his passion. It's what they're used to and it's the way they want to work. And so it's this collaborative effort between teams using digital that really is the way that we can attract people into that. And when we look at our digital transformation of the teams, the, the way that they work for us is to look for solutions to problems we have, and potentially solutions to problems we haven't yet identified. And the way they do that is to work collaboratively with the business units. We tend to break our digital work down into, into three areas. Subsurface, where these gentlemen have much more experience than I do in the way we do that. It's not just geosciences and geophysics, it's also the drilling areas, where we spend a great deal of our money. Francisco's chart showed you the capex numbers and the, and the returns after that. If we can bring costs down in those areas by good use of digital and the right interfaces, it's absolutely of importance to us. We then have a big bucket that we call industrial, which covers both the platforms, pipelines aspects, but it goes across our organization. We talk about refineries and terminals. And then there's the most interesting part for me, which is the work practices, how we change the way we work to flatten our organizations, to provide attractive careers to people, but to provide solutions to our business. Now, I'm not, I'm not intended to talk about marketing today because that's a, a, a separate subject altogether. And the way that we do that is to, for each of those areas I just talked about, we talked about data. There, what we do with data is to make sure it's available, it's understandable, it's a, and, and, and Francisco was clear about the cloud. I'll stop referring to Francisco and to refer to some of the other colleagues in a moment. But, but it, so that it's available to all of our staff such that they're able to access it and to use it, to find ways to use it to generate solutions for us. And then it comes back to the ways of working. So in my area, I just wanted to pick up a couple of examples before, before I would uh, conclude these few remarks. We talk a lot about smart rooms. We've used them for many years. It's an old thing in the industry. Get the various groups together, whether it's from geosciences, from drilling, to from production, from reservoir, from the architects, to the safety as uh, aspect. Digital changes the way we can do that and makes it much more pertinent to what we do on a daily basis. And it's not just access to information and having virtual twins of our installations. It's also about enabling that collaborative work, which is the way we create value. The next one I would pick on as an example is, is data analytics. We had a, a nice example we ran in the North Sea recently. The, in order to get some of the old guys like me on board, they called the project Dave. My name is not Dave. Um, but uh, our, our asset manager in the Northern North Sea, the mature platforms, this also applies to mature assets, uh, was a gentleman called Dave, and he was very enthralled by being uh, talked about in terms of data analytics and value exercise. <laughs> we created a large data lake with all of the information we could do. This is top side space, so nothing to do with geoscience. 
and looked at how we could use that, either through maintenance, and the thing they came up on first of all, and this generated a very quick payback, was predictions on cyclic wells. When are they going to fail and why are they going to fail? And can we do anything to predict it and therefore avoid it? It's paid back already. We only started it three months ago and it'll pay back in the next month and keep generating money for us until the end of the year. Again, a good business case for it. Maersk, when we merged with Maersk, they already had quite a long-standing relationship between Maersk drilling and IBM to talk about predictive drilling. Again, using data and using the interface with data in real time to see whether problems are going to occur to be able to avoid them. And then my last example is the one that we announced as an organization a couple of months ago, which is the collaboration with Google in the cloud, and this <coughs> is specifically to look at geosciences and geophysics, and to see how we can, over time, generate digital assistance so that our geophysicists spend more time looking at the real value add of the innovative part, generating ideas and interpretation, and get away from all of the initial number crunching and, and, and sorting of data to make it usable for us. And it's data right from, clearly the seismic data is already di digital. It's all of that analog data, text data that exists that we can then build into the overall model. Google, we thought this would be quite a nice thing to do with them. They were very impatient to do it. They wanted a very, very short contract and a very quick payback. We managed to put in place a two-year plan, but I think this is, and when I speak to our geosciences about it, it's more like a 10-year exercise. I think we underestimate probably how quickly it goes at the start, hence the two years. We are impatient in that sense to get after it, but we probably then underestimate the impact and how quickly it can go thereafter once you started to put these things in place. So it's early days in that partnership. It only started a couple of months ago, but already it's starting to show us what we can do going forward, such that when I speak to our geoscientists, they tell me they spend roughly 50% of their time doing repetitive tasks on the data to start with, and only 50% doing the real imaginative work that we want them to do to find the prospects we want to drill going forward or to understand the reservoirs. Our hope and our expectation is we can change that ratio to something like 90% spent on the real value add of what we're doing. So I hope what you can take from my comments is this is not just about digital, it's also about the people. And the people are really important in this because it's they that have to accompany the change and it's they that we have to attract into our organization to have that long-term buoyant and positive future that we talked about yesterday in the, in, in the opening uh, session. And that's where I would conclude my, my initial remarks. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very, very much. Um, and, and, and I have uh, just one particular uh, clarifying question. You mentioned that in 2015, uh, you started a whole new uh, internal organization. Uh, and I think as, as, as we speak of digitalization, we speak of technology, but we also speak about the organization, how you change the way that you organize your business uh, in order to enable uh, the, the enablers to, to function. Uh, and then, the, of course, there's the human, uh, the human resource issue. Um, but, but can you explain to us a little more about this particular organization? What did that mean? So, so the way it works internally for us is it sits within the overall research and development function, but it has a direct link to the top of our organization, whether it's for the total group or for exploration and production, which is specific, specifically what we're talking about today. And it sits there and works with each of the business units. So the way Total is organized is we have a number of business units that look geographically at the world, and I'm responsible for one of those. And then we have the, what we call the service function. So there's a, there's a strategy group, there's an exploration group, there's a, de a development and support to operations. And digital reaches into each of those to be able to identify problems whereby they may be able to help us find a solution. And then you get the collaborative work between the teams to try uh -huh. and find those solutions. Uh -huh. So, so, so this is the, yeah, the digital organization has become its own world, so to speak, diving and, and assisting into every other area of your business. 
it becomes fully integrated in the solution because I don't think you can have it as a separate organization. It has to work with, on the geosciences side, with the geoscientists. On the top side side, it has to work with the people designing refineries, the people designing our platforms, the people operating our platforms mm -hmm. to be able to seek solutions to the problems they've got and ultimately get value from the data. We have so much data. Right. And we have more data generated all the time. The key for this is to be able to find value in it. And, and how do you it make... It's only just, you know, it's just numbers and, 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 uh, um, and gigabytes, megabytes, petaflops, teraflops, I don't know what the correct terms are, of all of this information. Yeah. The key is to be able to find the value in it. The, the, the reason that... The, I think the digital means to, co to collectively, with the people, can start to work together. Right, and and the reason I ask is that tomorrow there's a whole session on on how to break down the silos within your industry. Uh, so I was wondering how people in a, in a new digital organization within your organization within your business, uh, how do you make sure that those people understand what happens uh, and what the needs are in each of your business areas in finance in in the, the geographical. Um, sectors of your of your organization. How do you make sure that the that the digital people understand what goes on in the rest of the business every day? It's a, it's a regular collaboration is the way to do it. We structure that in regular reviews, but we also set the teams up such that they interface properly. So in my organization, which is principally business around North Sea, I have one technology and digital officer whose job specifically it is to be in contact with the operations teams to find out problems and in contact with the digital teams to see whether they are, they are able then to analyze the data and provide solutions for us. Right. It's an integrated, collaborative approach across the organization. Interesting, interesting. And, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question selectors in a minute to, to add in. Just raise your hand if you have any questions whatsoever. Thank you very much. That's nice to know. Uh, but I'll, I'll take a, a cue from, from Michael here, because you, you mentioned both IBM, how uh, I, IBM and Mask Oil, which you have now, of course, taken over, has been working together for many years, as I remember. And you mentioned uh, a new collaborative arrangement with Google. Um, and speaking of technology, I was wondering if I could ask the rest of the panelists now to add your thinking on the question of outsourcing or working with the large IT companies. How will this uh, look in the future? Because obviously at one point or another, uh, I mean, the cloud, you cannot design yourself. You have a collaborative arrangement with somebody who organizes your cloud for you. And by the way, there is no cloud. It's all in cables still. I mean, we talk of a cloud as if it was just flying around up there, but it's sitting in a huge warehouse somewhere connected with cables. Somebody can cut the cables, but somebody who runs the organization, you need the big data guys out there, you cannot do it yourself. Despite your very large organizations, you're still dependent on somebody else who provides all this technology at least, and perhaps also know-how to a certain degree, and somehow you are getting more and more intertwined with, with the large providers of IT services. Uh, so could you add uh, a few words on how you deal with this? How do you, how, how do you see the collaborative uh, work in the future? Mr. Edgen. Sure, I'll take a shot at that. Um, I mean, there's insights out there everywhere. So, I mean, I guess I would hesitate to say that it's only the big IT historical organizations that are the only resource. There are certainly things that they are very knowledgeable and capable in and have a track record. And so where there's an intersection between what you're trying to do and what they have already done, it's a very natural thing to do. Uh, but if you only restrict yourselves to looking at those big companies, you're going to miss some stuff because there's all a whole ecosystem of innovation out there that you probably want to avail yourself of at some level. Of course, the problem becomes one of how do you keep that within, you know, kind of the doability of interfacing with lots of organizations. And that's fundamentally the trick, figuring out 
who to actually work with. But it's not just the big IT organizations. Well, do you have, I mean, you're a huge organization, 5,000 in Houston alone. Uh, do you have people who, who are out there scouting for bright uh, little startups that, that invent the next uh, digital? In fact, through two different lenses, in fact. We have, a, we have an organization we call the Digital Innovation Organization, whose primary job is to do that in the digital area. In addition, we actually own a venture capital firm. And so we actually look for investments in this area through a venture capital lens as well. Mm -hmm. What does Slumberger do in this field? Well, so let's take the, the first question. Yes. Um, I, I think one way or another, uh, most compute infrastructure will be in the cloud in the future. Most, and I would say up in the 90% uh, or so, I don't think we will have our own compute infrastructure in companies in over a period of time. You would take it slower or faster. The faster you move, the better off you are. And the compute infrastructure is going to be owned by a few companies. Uh, uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon are the cases in point. Uh, maybe a couple of others, but certainly for each individual company to maintain its own compute infrastructure is a thing of the past. And it's somehow going to move to uh, cloud-based infrastructure. Um, this being said, uh, once you have the infrastructure, on top of the infrastructure you have your data, your technology stacks, and for your technology stacks you have to work with the innovators out there. So we have our own, uh, as John was saying, uh, our own ventures organization. We opened a center in California about five years ago, and that center basically works in, at scouting, but relating, engaging uh, with a whole lot of people in the technology world. Uh, and we have similar kind of people looking at uh, startups all over the world today, if you like. Right? So there is no way to actually uh, keep all innovation in-house anymore. You have to uh, put together an ecosystem. In that ecosystem, there are large partners and there are small partners as well. And you are working with um, you know, upwards of 100 companies at any one time, if you like. You know. And this is just the reality of the day. You know. Yeah, it's the reality of the day. And, and would, you, would you care to make a prediction? I'm, I'm, you already sort of indicated what it's going to look like in five years. Will you have, let's say, less people uh, in-house that are dealing with computing, or will, will it sort of remain the same and just have more from outside as well? Well, so I think we, we work, for instance, in the world of high-performance computing and oil and gas with uh, people like Intel or NVIDIA, uh, people who are making CPUs or GPUs or different type of compute uh, infrastructure. We'll continue to work with those. So we will continue to have people who are understanding where is compute infrastructure going so that you understand how to spread your problems on different types of infrastructure. Uh, we will also work with the cloud companies because they are ahead of you in what, what this infrastructure is capable of doing. And so you will learn with them as to how to solve or how to implement your problems on the infrastructure of the future. Um, and so you'll have people inside working on how to implement your problems on, on the infrastructure. But the actual execution or the production level work uh, on infrastructure will be done in the large companies. Yeah. You would not be able to have your own infrastructure 10 years from now, if you like. No. Which, of course, I, 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 I don't want to sort of stretch this too far, but I think it's important that we do acknowledge uh, the security aspects here. Uh, so, so from Woodside's point, could you help us understand how how do you deal with, with the, the, the increase of necessary interaction with other, also smaller companies? Um, how do you maintain a level of safety that enables your company to work without increased risks? So I think Woodside absolutely recognises the risks uh, associated with cyber security, but... Uh, uh, you know, and and every employee, every time they log onto their computer in any of our organisations, signs up to a confidentiality agreement purely, but purely through that process. 
but uh, we, we have certainly made significant investments in trying to ensure that we are as secure as we possibly can be and that we, we maintain our licence to operate in that area. Uh, obviously, we can't talk too much about specifics, but we need to, we need to work with smaller organisations, particularly start-ups. I mean, it's never been easier for start-ups to get going these days, but to make sure that interactions that we have with those companies are, are, are data secure for everything that we do typically working with larger organisations, which the seismic industry has done since the beginning, more or less. They're, they have processes and protocols and security in place and are, and are very up to speed with dealing with large volumes of data and maintaining its security, um, uh, even though it, it might be great to, to steal a great pile of seismic data. It's a different thing altogether to make use of it and interpret it. So. Sure, sure. But, but Woodside certainly has put focused time and effort in, into maintaining that security. Um, but it is going to be a, an ever-increasing and an ongoing challenge. And uh, where, where there are gaps in that process, there, there will be people or organisations that may seek to exploit. Have, have, have you gone to any, let's say, changes in, in your recruitment process, for instance? Is there, is there an additional screening of people you'd like to employ? Uh, do you have intelligence people employed, or, or I mean, how far do you take this? So, so, so we haven't done anything different in terms of additional scrutin scrutinisation of potential employees, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, anyway, and I deal a lot with graduate recruitment, so, so, but we do certainly put a bit of a focus on, on what they can do and can't do in the organisation, and they are very aware of Woodside's rules and regulations. Mm. Mm. But uh, we haven't gone to the point of doing anything more in the intelligence world. I mean, uh, every I think one of the changes that, that we've made is that every person in the company can now contribute to competitive intelligence, but that's very different to security yeah. intelligence. Certainly. Yeah. Mr. Ortucosa, can you tell us more about how you work with the IT companies and, and what you expect from the future in, in this field? Uh, okay, what I can tell you is my personal perspective, okay? Please. So, I think connected to what you have been saying and the other uh, uh, colleagues here is that something that you cannot really uh, uh, change, what you, you will only need is the domain experts, okay? So this is something very important, and then it's going to happen that the domain experts, because they're going to have tools, they're going to be able to, 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 to do a much better work because they're going to have, they're going to be empowered, first of all, to understand the nature, to be able to, to, to see the mathematical way to formulate the nature, the, 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 the way to solve this equation numerically, and then with high performance computing. So this is going to be the kind of things that every domain expert is going to happen. So you are going to see, in my opinion, that we are going to change from calling IT, which is calling information technology, or always IT has some sort of history in every company, and we will start to call them operations technology. Because in reality, all of our operative uh, tasks that we're going to have are going to be uh, handled. I mean, this, uh, let's say, spare domain, some sort of data practitioners, uh, whatever you want to call them, they are going to need an infrastructure that is going to be part of it or most of it in the cloud with one of these providers. But there will be the part of the operation not only for these people or how we are dealing with infrastructures. As you said, the neighbor, the, 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 the cloud are cables. So <laughs> how are we going to deal with all of these cables? How are we going to deal from here? How are we going to deal in our fields? How are we going to deal if in our refineries? So more and more, I think that, that there will be creating this part, let's say, of, of activity, and then will come businesses that there will be uh, operation technology that will encompass from, 
from handling data to the infrastructure itself to the cybersecurity. I think that today, this kind of companies, they are just popping up. That is right. starting. More, we, we, every company mm -hmm. will do their own thing with their own people, trying to see how we organize. But of course, it's something, you know, that always IT people, they like to absorb things. I don't know if they will continue doing this thing or not, but I think that, that in my opinion, uh, IT will change to OT. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen, you've been very patiently sifting through what we say and what has come in. Give me a question, please. So first of all, the, the system works. We have uh, plenty of questions. We didn't count, but we have on the computer maybe about 50 questions I, today. What, what I can hear, I think, is you, somehow you need to get the computer or, or the microphone closer to your mouth. Okay. So I was just saying that uh, the system works. We have a lot of questions, thanks to all the contributors. Of course, they are, uh, they are arriving on, on the screen in a completely random order. Some are very generic, uh, try to address uh, general issues. Some are very specific. There are even questions on specific slides. Uh, what we can say is that right now, probably 90% of those questions can be put in three big baskets, three big categories. There are a set of questions focused on people, the people aspect that has been nicely uh, highlighted by Mike. So what kind of skills are needed? What kind of training? What kind of job are going to disappear? What kind of job are going to be created? Those kind of things. Second big basket is related to technology, either whether it is software things, whether it is hardware, and a lot of questions on clouds. And the Cloud. third- You said clouds. Clouds, yes. Yeah. What you call uh, wires and cables. <laughs> and the third basket is all the questions related to processes, workflow, organization, security. Again, a lot of questions about security directly linked to clouds. Is it safer to have your data in your pocket or is it safer to have your data at the bank? Just mm -hmm. a uh, lot of questions about collaboration, collaboration between IT companies and service or um, oil companies. Mm -hmm. So we have these three big categories. We will try to organize a little bit. And we start with uh, Massimo. We start with a quite generic one. Yeah, maybe the most uh, the most generic is um, about uh, the relationship of our oil and gas industry with other industries when it comes to digital. A lot of mentioning about automotive, about uh, biosciences, banking. about uh, logistics, uh, finance, banking. Oil and gas was perceived and is perceived to be at the leading edge of the technology. Are we still there with digital application? That is a summary of four, uh -huh. five, six questions at least. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, and that, of course, is always interesting. It's interesting to find out, are you still leading within comparable um, industries? But, but, but why bother? Why care, Massimo? Why is this important to know whether the ENP industry is still leading when it comes to computing uh, as compared to the automotive industry or healthcare? Why is that important? I think the first reason is because we need to learn. Um, we see a lot of other industries proceeding very, very fast in the digital, in the automation, uh, in the machine learning. And there is a lot to learn uh, about uh, how they are approaching their problems, how they are integrating their systems to evolve and change and transform their, their business as well. So I think there's a lot to learn and to adapt for our industry, but I think it's a nice question for our panelists too. <laughs> yes, thank you. Michael, you were first. I mean, I think it is important for us that we're perceived to be at the forefront of technology, because as I, as, I, as I mentioned right at the start, for me, this is also about people. And for us to attract the right people into our organization, we need to be perceived in the right way as an industry that is not living in the past right. with oil and gas, but is actually looking to the future and is able to attract the talent that we need to meet the challenges of the 21st century on climate change and energy transition. And I think we were at the forefront. I mean, clearly the gentleman sitting next to me 
geosciences was at the forefront of all of the digital stuff. Have we been caught up and overtaken? I think we've certainly been caught up. I don't think it's important whether we've been overtaken or not. The important thing is whether we're reacting in the right way now to set ourselves up for the future. We've tended, and I don't think this is alone, uh, total alone, to have an infrastructure that we've protected and to keep everything internally. And right. it's a fundamental transformation for us to go outside and to do things on the cloud. But it's also an opportunity for us to demonstrate to the wider industry what we're up to and what we can do, and therefore to be able to attract the people that we need. Mm -hmm. To answer the question about people, who do we need coming into our industry in this sphere? I think you're after people, and people that are obviously well qualified, but that have the right mindset. And it's a mindset question for me, people that are open, that are inquisitive, that are looking for solutions, but that are able to work in a collaborative environment. And when I mentioned in my opening comments about collaborative environments and how you promote that, there are numbers of things that I'm sure we're all doing internally to push people to a new way of addressing problems. To right. put them in sort of booster type environments where all the tools are available for them and they're able to concentrate for a significant period of time on a new problem and think about it in a new way. And uh -huh. that's what makes us innovative. I mean, when I talk to, 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 to people from the next generation down, there's so much we're able to offer in terms of careers because I think we're now addressing where we're trying to get to. Uh -huh. so, yeah, I think we are attractive as an industry. It's interesting. Thank you. Um, um, I'm simply going to ask you, Mr. Bellani, to comment on this particular topic. I mean, the question basically was whether the, the industry is, is still... Uh, let's say, on par with, uh, with those who are now very, very much into computing or, or digitalization and using these new, new enablers in the health industry, automotive, uh, and you name it. Uh, lots of people are good at this now. Well, I think maybe, maybe we've got to make some stark statements so that we uh, like exaggerate a little bit to bring out the, 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 the sense here. It's not a question of leading in these technologies. We can forget about that. The oil and gas industry is never going to lead in the digital world of today, if you like. You know, and I'm not talking about digital in in uh, the 80s or the 90s. It's these capabilities today. So, for instance, uh, take take uh, cloud computing or or not cloud computing, but technology stacks that are making you real-time performant by utilizing the platform aspects of cloud. There is nothing. Nothing that happens in the oil and gas industry today, ENP, that is utilizing that on an ongoing basis. We are at some proof of concept stage, a little bit of application here, a little bit of application there. And when we consider our industry with respect to other industries, it's not a question of whether we are leading, it's a question of is there capability out there which is relevant to other industries and is also relevant to us, can make us more performant, and we are not using it, or are we using it? That's the point. The point is that there is capability out there. We are not using it today, and we should be using it. We should get on with this idea that we can't do it for this reason or that reason or that reason. If we don't adopt it, if we don't say that this is a priority, if we don't say that this is a big winner in the future, then we will not get the people, we will not train the, the, the right kind of competencies, and we will never get on with it. Fact is that there is capability out there which can be leveraged in this business, and today, by and large, we're not doing it. Huh. Darren Harris, what are you going to do about that? Uh, well, we try to get as much of that capability internally as we can through our recruitment process, but you're right. Um, digital for the for the ENP industry is not the primary focus. It, it is for the, the, the larger, you know, financial and the Googles of this world that that are pushing the bleeding edge uh, of this this um, technology, we are picking up a lot of material from the Googles and the Amazons uh, of this world and implementing and learning as much as we can from those organisations. Hmm. I, I was thinking, uh, as Michael was speaking earlier, is it is it really important that we are leading? I think it is important that we are leading uh, in terms of attracting the right capability. I think where we really need to lead... 
is in reaping the rewards or maximising the value from the implementation of this type of technology. That's where we really need to lead. But it sort of goes hand in hand if, if you don't have a carrot that attracts the right people into the organisation, then they're going to go to places where, where, the, where they can see clear demonstration of leadership in those industries as opposed to our own. We are, we are trying to follow, but, but we are not there yet. I mean, Woodside has an aspiration to get all of our, um, our platform into the cloud as, as soon as possible, like this is within, within years, not, uh, not decades. I mean, it's, we, we're trying to do that as fast as we possibly mm. can, and that enables better sharing and better collaboration internally and externally. But, uh, but yeah, I, I certainly don't think we're leading at this point and, uh, and we need to leverage as much as we possibly can fr from those companies that are leading. Mm. This is fascinating. John Etkin, I, I'm, I'm starting to think there is, there is also a psychological aspect to this or, or at least an identity uh, aspect to this of the oil industry as such. Uh, within your organisation, is there a change of, of perception of, of self uh, when it comes to this leadership role in the world? Uh, and does that change the way you organize yourselves? I mean, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, the oil and gas operator company of the past, you know, in a lot of ways, I don't want to say its days are numbered, but it, it definitely has to change itself. And, and I think we all recognize that. I think you're hearing that from everyone mm -hmm. here. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change tack a little bit on you, and I'm going to say... You know, fundamentally, we produce primary sources of energy. That's our business. It's not our business to necessarily be the foremost innovators in kind of the evolving world of machine intelligence. Right? So we are going to be in a place of harvesting those things and putting them to the use of creating and producing primary energy for the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when you put it in that lens, you can figure out what you want your organization to be like. Right? So your organization is still going to have domain expertise in it. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be very important. But can I add a word here that I've now waited uh, more than an hour to hear one of you mention? Oh. It's the word renewables. Hasn't been entered into the discussion yet, which is interesting. Uh, thinking well, I, of what, I use what, the word what primary energy, which meant to include all four. I, I know you meant to include it. <laughs> I'm just making a point here that we spoke a lot about renewables yesterday when we were talking about the future and how to position the industry, and none of you have mentioned the word yet. I'm just making this um, as a as a journalistic point here. I think. Um, but just to sharpen the edge here a bit and say, if, if you are not yet uh, enabling uh, all these enablers within your organizations, how then would you think uh, the digitalization could assist you in the era of transition, which we have been put in by the very title of this whole conference? Um, is, is how will digitalization enable you as organization to embrace transition as such, which of course means all sorts of other new activities, new way of prioritizing your businesses. Uh, can one say that digitalization has a role there or is that, let's say, a secondary issue when we talk transition? No, I think it, it's probably very much at the forefront. I mean, in a world of abundant primary energy, it is the resources that are going to be the most competitive, in some sense of the word, in their carbon footprint, in their fundamental price, in their accessibility to the market, whatever it is. And, you know, I mean, around some of the remarks that Ashok made, it's pretty clear that as an industry, as a primary energy industry, we are behind other industries in running our total business in a digital way, because we do not yet. Mm -hmm. There are still many elements that are kind of seat-of-the-pants decisions that is not true in other industries anymore. Mm. So if you want to be the most efficient provider of primary energy, and that means of all forms, then these kinds of ways of thinking that allow you to combine the human factors with the ability of machines to accelerate and enhance human performance and, and ultimately actually drive genuine decisions and automation itself, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're gonna have to go that way. There's no other choice. Anyone who doesn't do it won't be in business. So, where goes? Any thoughts at this point? Well, I there, there is several ways to call the energy transition, and one of the ways that, that we can definitely call it is towards low carbon impact or footprint energy. 
So in these ways, I'm very sure that all kind of energy that, 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 that is, is covered by, by this idea, even, even the, I mean, it, it will benefit uh, absolutely because of the efficiency. So it's very important that in all the operations, it doesn't matter where we are, the, the, the carbon footprint will be reduced significantly if we, are, if, we are, if we are very efficient. And something that is going to be covered by the decision in all the, in all the spectrum, from traditional to pri other primary sources of energy that cover under the low carbon footprint, will be, will be benefited. So, and, and, and we don't even see, I mean, and, and there are ways that will be benefited because of the way that, that not the, this energy is produced, by how this energy is transmitted, how this energy is commercialized. There are yeah. so many ways that will be, will be very efficient that we are just uh, picking into, into the future and uh, uh, will, uh, will be able. So our company Repsol last last week we have the we have the update of our study plan. So you will be see how we are dealing with this energy transition absolutely and, and and efficiently. And I think that we are in line with the most advanced uh, ideas that, that we can see in the industry today. Gentlemen, question selectors. Let, let's just one more uh, question on technology. Uh, you said that there was an interest in, 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 in the cloud, how we interpret the cloud. Can you, is there a further question on that particular issue? On the cloud, we have many, many questions, people challenging the cloud. Uh, people saying that there is a lot of commercial push from IT companies. Where is the real benefit? Can we prove it? That's one aspect of the cloud. Uh -huh. Second one, is uh, the security, again. Uh, is it better to have your data outside your walls or inside? Yeah. So commercial aspect, strategic aspect, collaboration, mm. and also a lot of things on, on security, data security. Any office? Sure. Yes, Mr. Etty. I think, you know, big enterprises have been hacked, both, uh, you know, both providers and, you know, self-sourcing providers, so. I think the security thing, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of pick your poison. I mean, nobody can claim that they're 100% safe, right? So you do the things you do. I think, you know, everybody here is probably very cognizant of what they're doing in their own organizations. Um, that world is a constant arms race, so I'm not sure how that's going to evolve. I don't think that's a big differentiator for the cloud. Um, I, I'm going to be a bit of a heretic and say I don't think the transition is going to go as fast as the other gentlemen claim. Um, that may be due to my own experience because we have both... Sorry, when you say transition here, you mean transition as into in, the cloud? Yes, as in no one will own high-performance computing in their own shop anymore. Um, I, I think right now we are certainly in a wave of moving things to external providers. Um, it's not clear how far that will ultimately go. I think there's still value in having access to resources very near you that you control its architecture, you control the software it's running, you control all aspects of it. I'm sure the gentleman may disagree with that. Uh, but fundamentally, I like to use the notion of, do you see the computer as a printer or as a toaster? So a printer, if you print $20 bills, you want that thing running all the time flat out. <laughs> but yes. your toaster, you don't necessarily want it making toast all the time. But when you want toast, you want it exactly the way you want it. And you want it right now. Right? So depending on what your mission is, if it is to satisfy one particular very specific need that you need and that you know what it is and you have very specific tastes around it, uh -huh. sometimes having control of that resource yourself is better. Now, yep. if what you're doing is just running things kind of in a continual basis all the time, then really it comes down to the efficiencies and economies of scale. Um, and so, you know, if your mission is really a service provider where you are for profit doing computing, then I think the cloud's a very natural transition. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you're doing very specialized R&D and, and your mission is really about advancing technology, less about making money from that technology today, uh, you may find that actually having some control of what you're doing in the computing space is still valuable to you. Yeah. I, I have a... May, may, I, I have, Please. 
So it's very interesting this point because ASOC was very good when he pointed out that we are lagging, lagging behind other companies. But you know, in the matter of the kind of things, do you know why? My opinion is because we have an unreasonable fear to the security of the data. This is the reason. Fear. Fear. We are in the oil, in the oil industry so fear about the data, about the things, everything so, that we are lagging behind. So how long are we going to continue lagging behind other industries because of, in my opinion, unreasonable fear to, uh -huh. to the security of the data? Mr. Bilani, would you like a toaster or a printer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that I would go to that analogy. Go ahead. Uh, my, my only comment was going to be that I find that in the oil and gas industry, sometimes we get a little bit arrogant. Um, if we look at the IT industry, the Googles and the Amazons of this world, whenever they have a security breach, everybody knows about it. They have been working on data security for a lot longer and a lot har harder than we have. There may well have been any number of security breaches in our organisation, but nobody hears about it. So uh, I think we're probably a little bit arrogant in thinking that we've got better security systems than the Googles and the Amazons of this world. I, I will add on to this. Please. Any of the IOCs, you name any one of them, a data center managed by that IOC is less safe than any of the cloud companies. There is just no comparison between the two safeties. You know. Why do you say that? Because those people, it's their profession to do that, and it is not the profession of the IOCs. It's just, it's just like that. You know. any, any piece of data inside the cloud companies is safer than any piece of data inside a small company. And I, can, I consider the IOCs as small companies in this aspect. You know. I see. And I'm talking about IOCs. <laughs> the rest of the industry doesn't even have a shot at this. You know. <laughs> So uh, you, you've, got to, you've got to call a cat a cat. Those people, they, by the way, Gmail is one of the safest G, uh, mail platforms in the whole world. Yeah. I'm glad for to hear reason. that. It's for a reason. Yeah. I have a, just, a, just a nice little example. In Please. our own internal world, our system doesn't allow us to use WhatsApp. WhatsApp is one of the most secure systems they exist to be able to send messages between Well, it, it, well you, you only have send to send a be number of other things now than just messages. Well, what was that? In? Have to be and so we're in the about process, what? I think, of opening up a little bit our systems <laughs> to be able to benefit from the expertise of some of the real professionals. So what you're saying is that your security people have been, let's say, ignoring uh, a more safe system of sending messages or... I'm not being critical of our... Right? <laughs> no, no, I, I was just security. wondering what's happening here. Is, is, is the world is changing, and uh, our world is changing internally in ENP, and we are becoming aware that there are many people that are more professional in some of the areas like cybersecurity than us that we can benefit from. And that's the direction in which we're going. Uh, the second part of it is, I think, I like to have a toaster and I like to have a printer, particularly if it's printing uh, yes. bills. Uh, and so... I think where we're likely to be going in the short term is keeping some proprietary ability to be able to crunch things internally on proprietary so solutions that we want, but also to benefit from the cloud. And, it's a, and then it's a question in my mind of balance as to how quickly you move from one to the other. Yeah, and of course, I, I a, a hugely complex question of organization, because if you have some information lying around in, in your basement uh, on a huge stack, uh, and, and other lying around in the cloud, I mean, then you have to search two places when you need it. And then where, where does the speed go that Mr. Uh, Ortigosa was talking about as the prime target of this digitalization is really the speed and efficiency. So if you still have two piles of information, then you have to search through both before you find what you need. It's not, it's not true, because at the end of the day, what, the, what is bringing you the, the, the whole concept of data lake decision is, uh, is that you may have any piece of information anywhere, but they are consistent and together in the same, they can be in the same place, they can be accessed. It's what, what access and information is full time. So. You, you may have different places, and right. it's really consistent. I think so you've you got to put things into perspective here. You know, we, we, if you take one of the cloud companies, say, take, take Google, for just for the sake of Microsoft is the same and Amazon is the same. 
the amount of data they have and the amount of compute they do, um, if you take their whole infrastructure that is doing compute and uh, uh, storage on an ongoing basis, the whole oil and gas industry, all of it put together, is less than 0.1% of what they do uh, all the time. So for them to be able to handle this part in terms of speed and performance is a piece of cake. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a drop in the ocean, if you like. So again, you know, we've got to keep ourselves. However, it's, are there security issues? Yes, there are security issues. But it's not a deterrent from being able to use that scale to your advantage, if you want. It's just one more thing that you have to perform. It's one more thing that you have to keep ahead of. There are bad guys that are going to be working, and you just have to keep ahead of the bad guys all the time. But there are technologies to do that, practices to do that, and you just have to keep on top of that. Yeah. Now, um, Mr. Ortigosa used a very strong word uh, and indicated that there might still be lingering fears within the industry when it comes to the, the, the real progress that the, the uh, technology is, is, um, is offering. Um, do you recognize that, that sentiment, Mr. Etkin? No, actually I don't. Actually I think, I mean, maybe I wasn't clear in my remarks. I mean, I think, I think security issues in terms of preventing you from going to external providers for all sorts of things fundamentally can be made a non-issue. Um, no, I, I think the, the, the fear probably comes around, are you really getting the right commercial terms? You know, do you really think that this is going to save you money? Uh, and in fact, quite frankly, you're often talking about people's jobs, right? So there are yeah. people inside your organization who have a vested interest in propelling a status quo model um, that may be actually dragging the efficiency of your company. And so they're going to find ways of arguing against it. So I think you see that in, in a lot of places. But, but I would second your comments on, on cost. In some cases, when we're trying to run, you know, Woodside's been pushing the full waveform inversion envelope. A lot of other companies are doing that. But it's the cost, really, that is the challenge at the moment. And sometimes it's cheaper to use your own compute than it is to use cloud. I think we've got past the reliability issues now, but it's really, it's cost. It, yeah. If the cloud cost gets right, then things will move faster, I think. And, and that was the second half of the question uh, from, the, from the floor, uh, was where is the profitability? Uh, or is that really an issue that one can afford to discuss any longer? Uh, the profitability of, of having your own stacks or, or, or using somebody else's. Um, is, is there an option anymore? Or is it simply a, 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 a demand that you move on to the cloud? Can you even negotiate with the companies anymore? Or are you simply forced to go that way? To be honest, I, I don't fully agree with, with this. I, I think... Okay, we have been dealing with supercomputers for many years. I believe me, the cloud is significantly much, much, much cheaper. Cheaper. So I can, okay, if you already, it's, it is. So, so, I mean, you can have a, I don't know, half a beta flop for, I don't know, pff, you don't want how many hours. I don't want to give any details for 200 bucks. So <laughs> you cannot even have dinner today for this money. But that may well be because you have your own internal supercomputers, whereas we don't. So the, the cost competition might not be the same for ourselves. No, I think, I think Daryl, what is true is that if you take like-for-like -like computing, yeah. uh, and if that computing is available in the cloud, then really there's not much comparison. Yeah. It is cheaper in the cloud. But when you talk about full waveform inversion or uh, some of these things which require special configurations which are not scalably av available in the cloud, you could have a cloud uh, yeah. cost which is higher. But it's for, for a like-for-like -like comparison when you are just asking for, say, a thousand CPU clusters or uh, racks, there is no comparison between the cost in cloud and cost in-house. Yeah. Yeah, the, the examples I was citing were, were probably specifically related to what we've been trying to do with the full wave form. Right. So if you require an 8 GPU to C 1 CPU ratio or something, then you may not have that configuration yeah. available for, for the right price. Yeah. Gentlemen in the back, 
could you help me move on to the topic of human resources? I know this, of course, is, is on the minds of many people at this conference. Is, is, am I still relevant uh, in five years from now? We, so, we have a lot of questions about that. I thought the, so. A, a romantic spin as well to the discussion, if you like. Uh, many questions about um, the role of the geoscientist in this uh, context of automation. Uh, a nice question saying, machines uh, don't uh, love seismic data as I do. <laughs> <laughs> I like that uh, very much. Meaning, what is the role of the uh, geoscientist in this picture of high automation and how is uh, making and leveraging the uh, geoscience portfolio. Yeah, thank you very much. This was a very specific question and I urge all five of you to answer it with the same sincerity that it was phrased. Because obviously this is at the core of many people's, uh, let's say, speculations and worries at this stage. Uh, so as nuanced as you can, please, Michael. So it, I think it's something I, I tried to allude to in the comments earlier when we were talking about the role of the geophysicists and the, and the geoscientists overall. Uh, I think our view in the, in the near and medium term is that uh, the computing power and the digital aspects uh, w should allow the geoscientists to create more value for us because they're able to concentrate more on what they are able to do that the machines cannot currently replicate. I don't know where it'll go in 20 years' time, and so I would concentrate just on the next 5 to 10 to 15 years. And what, what we are trying to do is to take some of the grunt work out to allow the imaginative work to be able to take place, and it's that that creates value. And it would be that that I would also add to the debate just before we ask this question about internal costs versus the cloud costs. To, to a degree, that's missing the point for me because what we're trying to do, and it's the collaborative bit with the people involved, is to get the people to look at where we can create value from the data. Mm -hmm. That's what we're about. And so if we can free up more time for the geoscientists to create value, then we win in the overall situation. But Whether that means that long term there are as many positions for geoscientists in our organizations, I don't know the answer to that. Would you say that the, the uh, change in the ratio that you imagine between what the computer does and what the scientist does, um, does that change the, um, the skills that you would be looking for uh, from a scientist? Is, is it the same skills base, the sk same expertise, or do we calibrate now the, uh, w what a scientist is in a different way? I think you do, absolutely. I think the skill set changes and evolves, and therefore they are concentrating more on being able to use their skill set to create value and to find the whether it's the prospect, whether it's the fault patterns, whether whatever it may be, to be able to use that to create value for us. And it's a collaboration then between the individuals. And so, yes, the skill sets change and evolve over time. And what does that absolutely mean? Absolutely, after the individual that asked the question, people that are passionate about the data because they're able to find value in it for us and mm -hmm. assist us in making decisions. Right. Mm. So, so I, I think at this point in time, I mean, good science is about hypothesis testing. So uh, you have a number of ideas or concepts and you want to test them against the data. So that is absolutely where the computer comes into its own because it can look at all of the data and test those hypotheses. At the moment, and I think I mentioned this a, a little earlier, coming up with those hypotheses is still in the realm of the user, the geoscientist. But it, do we get to a point... Uh, and I'm, I can't answer this question really, where the hypothesis also comes from the computer. Now, that might be a little bit tougher because the Earth is the Earth and it's infinitely variable and everything you look at is different, but maybe there are enough similarities where we get to the point where the hypothesis can come from the computer and the data testing can come from the computer. I, I'm not sure about that. I, I can't, can't see that in the future at this point, but, but it may be out there. Mm -hmm. You always um, look at, at these statistics. I don't remember exactly 
because I have heard several times the same idea, but with different figures. But more or less is that there is this exercise in the US where, where uh, with learning machine, uh, a computer can diagnose, diagnose uh, I don't know which kind of cancer, let's say 70 something percent of the times with machine learning, and then uh, the best oncologists can do in 70 something percent. But then together, they, they, their, 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 their true diagnosis is 90 something percent. And I think that this is true. I think that we are going to benefit tremendously from this work of, 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 of the work we are, uh, empowering uh, the people with the, with the eyes of the machine. But the point is that this person, they have to learn the new skills. We mm. all have smartphones. It took some time to learn the smartphone, but now everything is different. So we will, they will have to learn the new skills. And this is, but this is up to themselves. It's, it's, it's up to them. So is, is the, the, the new skills that need to be learned? Most of them related to computing, related topics or data, related topics, they, they will have to learn. Uh -huh. Spilani. I, I think uh, to, to answer the question exactly as, as it was asked, I think this industry will always add or find new reserves because of the passion of the geoscientist. And it is the individual, not the machine, by any means. You know. So, but however, all these digital technologies, are they going to make the life of the geoscientist a lot more, uh, first of all, performant, but also enjoyable because he visualizes the data in a completely different way. He visualizes the models in a completely different way. He can make a lot more uh, um, hypothesis, uh, uh, let's say, uh, test more hypotheses and uh, just uh, just his experience will become, I think Francisco said it very well before, it's the, the domain person who's driving it, and his experience is becoming a lot, lot better in uh -huh. the future than in the past. You know. So all these are significant enablers. They leave the, the mechanical, well, mechanical is the wrong word, the automatable aspects out of his, uh, his need to do uh, list, if you like, and it leaves him to do a lot more interpretation, judgment, uh, and real exploration, if you like. In the yes. What uh, Ashok just said, and uh, it's it's an issue which is crossing the people aspect and the technology aspect. Uh, many many people say, okay, today we cannot dispute the fact that let's say 90, 95 percent of data will be processed by a machine. So we are going to a stage where we will have terabyte, petabyte of automatically interpreted data. How can we QC? How can we ensure quality of those terabytes of data? Can it be also done by a machine? Or huh. is it for us humans still to QC this petabyte of data? And if yes, how are we going to do that? Many questions <coughs> about the theme. Uh huh. Interesting. Here is perhaps a new role for another set of geoscientists: the quality control of of these terabytes that the machine just spit out in five seconds. Um. <laughs> wow, it's actually a very fascinating question. Um, I mean, I think human beings have been in the QC business of seismic images for a long time. I'm not sure that they really felt like it was all that satisfying an occupation. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, you know, maybe to link to some of the previous comments, um, do not underestimate the bandwidth of the human eye-brain system. It really is a remarkable inference engine and visual processing system that, to my knowledge, has not really been fully replicated by machines yet. Um, now, they're doing certain things they can do a lot faster than we can do, but in terms of deriving insight, no, they don't. Um, so. You know, I think that notion of will the machines digest, you know, the vast, vast majority of the data? Yeah, I believe so. But what they should do is present it to us in a way that maximizes the use of our brain bandwidth. And that's the thing that I think is kind of missing today. So the question around what will the geoscientists of the future be like, 
um, I think he's going to find himself a lot more engaged in the stuff that's actually genuinely value-adding, which is understanding what the hell's really going on down there, mm -hmm. as opposed to clicking buttons and messing with mice and finding menus and loading data and trying to do all that kind of crap. You know, that stuff is going to, hopefully, if we get this right, <laughs> be completely removed from you, um, or at least removed as much as possible. But I think that, that notion of <coughs> don't be afraid of the machines digesting a lot of the data. I mean, we already do that, right? I mean, the, the volumes of data in terms of bytes that we collect in the field. I mean, Ashok can probably give you an idea of how much data Schlumberger collects in a month. I guarantee you no human ever looks at all of it. It's, it's just not possible, right? It's already condensed, you know, three, four, five, six, seven orders of magnitude as it is. I'm not doing the math accurately on the fly, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, so don't be afraid of that. That's not, that's not the issue. It's, it's how to present it to you in a way that makes effective use of that carbon-based computer that's between your ears, that's actually really well suited to some of these problems. Mm -hmm. There's an, uh, uh, let's pursue the, the, the question of control and, and quality control. Um, how is that to be done in the future, Mr. Bellani? What, what, what will the role of the scientist be in that respect? Well, I, I think the question is, I would say, posed in and uh, somewhat interesting. I think the line of logic of John is exactly right. We, we, when we acquire, and in this case, when we talk about petabytes, it's only seismic which has petabytes of data. So when an interpreter actually looks at the data, that data has already been changed from petabytes to tens of gigabytes. You know, it's just gone through like a 10,000 fold reduction because you processed out uh, all of, now, but in that processing, there is QC that has been done. It's been done by the geophysicist, and that QC is going to be enabled or helped by the machine because, for instance, you have first break picks, and exactly as John said, first break picks are a pain in the butt for a geophysicist to spend time on, and so he will leave that to the machine to do it in a large sense. He will uh, QC the total result of the machine, and so it will make his life a lot easier. Uh, and at each stage of the processing, he is able to QC how the processing has represented the subsurface uh, better and better, how it has used the velocity model better and better. So the, the capability of the machine helps the geophysicist transform that data from the petabytes to uh, tens of gigabytes or say hundreds of gigabytes. When it comes to hundreds of gigabytes, then it's in Francisco's uh, video, if you like, yep. and then you have a certain amount of automated interpretation uh, modules which are working and they are enabling the geoscientists to go a whole lot faster, if you like. Right? And at every step, even when it's picking the faults or picking the tops, the geoscientist is QCing what it's doing all the time, right? So it's, it's, it's not like everything is done and then nobody QCs it. That, that's not the right way to look at it, you know. There are lots of steps along the way and you're QCing all along the way and the machine is helping you QC as you go along the way, you know. But, but, but so it's making your life a lot simpler and keeping your, you at the interpretation level rather than at, uh, in the weeds uh, trying to do the mechanical part of the, the, the process. And there's still a few human beings in the room. No, no, I th I th th this idea that human beings are going to go away is, is I, I don't know why a geophysicist would want to think like that, or a geologist. Uh, a geologist and a geophysicist, the geoscientists of the oil and gas industry are the people who are going to find reserves, and they're going to continue doing this for a long, long, long time. Yeah. And then there is always, of course, as, as Michael has been uh, telling us several times now, the question of recruiting. Uh, and that often means young people. Uh, you have to uh, attract young people in the future to stay interesting, relevant, sharp, and future-minded, obviously. That's a banal statement. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, to bring that up again, and I would like to return to something that you said, Daryl Harris, uh, at the very, very start of this, uh, this morning. You, you talked about a program of yours, Citizen Data Scientists. And, and I think uh, it, it would be helpful here if you would expand a little on that and then tell us how would you see in the age of digitalization and transition, what are the skill sets 
that you would need uh, or look for within the new generation of recruits uh, to your company? So, so this, the citizen data scientist uh, approach is, is really all about enabling those people that have the questions to, to look and search through the data to answer the, the questions themselves. Now, I think we had a discussion on the way home, over a little bit. We all have very diverse organisations with people from, you know, 40 years' experience to virtually no years' experience. So, so one of the ways to try and bring the value out of that person with 40 years' experience in a new digital world is to give them some access to either working with the citizen data scientist or giving them access to the tools to do it themselves. Now, that may be a bit of a challenge and uh, I think, gosh, I'm trying to think of the last time I did any scripting, which is all it would have been called, scripting to manipulate data files. It would have been 10, 15 years ago probably. But, you know, can we retrain those people or can we provide those people with simple tools? And I think the tools are becoming much more intelligent themselves uh, such that when you're asking a question, it doesn't have to be written in computer speak. Um, we're getting to the point now where the questions can be asked as you talk to your mobile phone um, in Siri speak, dare I say it, with preference to one or the other. But you can ask a question in normal language and get answers. Can we get to the point where using and training those citizen data scientists, we can get to that point where we can ask that simple question in normal language of our collective intelligence within each of our organisations. That seems to me to be the really exciting place where technology could add some value and help us out a great deal. In terms of um, recruitment, obviously we would, you know, at, at the early stage we need people who can do some of the coding type work and those skills are certainly um, valuable. But if we get to a point where it is just simple application of normal language, then does that coding work become the core responsibility of the people that are working in exploration and production companies? Or is that, that coding part of it external and we're just asking the right questions? That's very interesting. I know from some statistics that a very large percentage, more than 50% of the jobs that young people will be sitting in 20 years from now haven't been invented yet. Uh, so, so there is a great challenge in, 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 of course, in the educational system. Let's leave that for the moment, uh, but also for companies like your own. I mean, you will get people into the through the door, and they will basically be looking at jobs that haven't been invented yet, uh, or functions at least that haven't been invented yet. So, how do young people? Uh, how should they look at this? What, what, what kind of um, training will you be looking for? What kind of qualities within the, the, the next generation will you be hiring in, say, two, three, four years from now? That's an easy one. We like people who run towards problems. Right? <laughs> well, is that? That sounds like Houston. I guess, uh, <laughs> I, I, guess I would have said I couldn't have described what my job is now had I looked back, you know, had I looked, tried to look forward 20 years ago. So I think the notion that the job is changing, that, that's always true, right? The yeah. jobs are always changing. So you, you want people who are, who are curious and eager, and I, th I think some of my colleagues even express these sentiments already, uh -huh. and they are willing to run towards a challenge rather than shy away from it. Mr. Mm -hmm. Ortiz, goes on. And you'll hire them based on some kind of cross-section of skills that seems modern and commensurate with the task at hand today, but, but they're going to have to grow and learn and change, but, but, we all have. Simply speaking, I mean, your computing skills, your, your interpretation skills when it comes to 3D imaging, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is that already just assumed that, that this is f forms f part of your basic skills, or, or will this increase? I mean, I think, again, the domain expertise is not going away, so we will still want people who have been trained, dare I say, classically in that stuff. Um, but I think now there's just a lot more that probably behooves you if you know it. I think that notion of the citizen data scientist is a quite apt one. I think people who, who are domain experts yet also know how to play in the data science world is a very powerful one. We, we don't use the same term, but we have kind of the same concept. Um, you know, I guess 
the thing for me that's the question that I don't know how to resolve is, you know, are we continuing to move towards an era of hyper-specialization, which I think we have in the past. You know, geophysicists tended to you know, be imaging geophysicists or acquisition geophysicists or signal processing geophysicists. Mm -hmm. you know, are we going to continue that trend of hyper-specialization, which I think ultimately probably has to break down because then you know, I just don't know how you, I don't know how you function with that many subspecialties. Um, or does it actually begin to remerge where you have kind of the conglomeration of skills and maybe they get repackaged in a different way? I, I don't know. That, I, I don't know the answer to that question. But I think that, that's more of the fundamental thing is, you know, will people find ways of agglomerating multiple skill sets and be more uniformly valuable? Or will we continue the current trend where actually you get more and more deeply specialized into what are currently quite technically deep topics, but maybe quite narrow? Massimo, input here. I, I read a, a sense of frustration in some of the questions here about um, basically the pace of uh, the transformation. Uh, I would summarize at least five, six questions with which are the barriers to transform our industry into digital faster than we are doing today. Okay. Let's leave that as the last question that I will ask everybody to answer before we close in 10 minutes. I'd like to remain for one minute uh, on the issue of skill sets and young people. Uh, yes, please. I think that we are describing here the people from the 80s. I don't know. Yes, it's true. I don't know if you know the millennials at the, the new generation Z. That they don't use Facebook because it's outdated. So, the, the new people that are going to be hiring, they have completely mindset. So, and then, I don't know if, if you realize, we already know that, that the talent pool is very, is very shallow, but we don't realize the talent pool is so shallow. Do you know that according to the, the NSF, in the United States, in the last 15 years, the average number of PhDs in advanced mathematics, robotics, computer engineers, and statistics is less than 1,000 per year. The average. It has been a, a, a very nice uh, debate in Bloomberg between this company, Tencent Holdings, which is an artificial intelligence company in China, that they say that there are only 200,000 people that they have this skill in the world. Versus this element, uh, artificial intelligence from Canada, they say there are only 22,000. So people that they are really going to change your, change your industry. Not people that they know, they know. It's only that amount of people. These are, these are the people that they can really transform your business. Yeah. It's not enough. But you know what? You can say, look, it's not, it's, it's not important because now all the universities are creating all kind of these studies. They're going, okay, these people that they are uh, ending, they, they don't want to make careers. They don't want to have these big salaries they're going to have five years and then have a startup. Because they want the billion dollars. You know, this guy, I don't know, I mean, you know, you know this guy, Chan Peng Zhao, Canadian Chinese, 41. He has made two billions for himself in 180 days. <laughs> so if you don't know, you have to know these people because the people you want to recruit, they know them. Because this is what they want to emulate. They want to make two billions in 180 days. Me too. So you know, you know, you know, Chris Larsen, this is another superhero. He has made the same money. He has made the same time 20 billion. In the next uh, fortune uh, list, he's going to be ahead of Zuckerberg. Yeah. And this, these are making money with Interesting. The, the digitalization. So these are and the sorry. I'm going to ask Michael just to make one final uh, comment on this before we make a final round, because you, you've been very forceful uh, in talking about how you want to make the industry remain attractive to, as a place to work for young people. So could you address this issue by telling the audience here what kinds of skill sets you will be looking for 
as Total uh, over the coming five, ten years, recruiting new people? It's a, it's a difficult one because because we're in a, a world that's moving very quickly and probably uh, the rate determining step in how quickly it moves is the ability that we have as individuals in the organization to embrace that change. And, and so the way I see it is that we're looking for people, I think John said it earlier, uh, I wouldn't use the exact expression of, of, of running towards problems and challenges, but it's, but it's people that have an education that allows them to fit into our organizations, and I'll come back to my creation of value. What we're after with digital and the data sets is actually to find value in it. And those are the sorts of people we want in our organization, and they need to be open, inquisitive, have been able to demonstrate they can work together and demonstrate that they're open to change. I think that the sorts of careers that I've had in an organization where you stay in an organization for 35 years and progress through that, they're probably gone. And therefore, we need to be accompanying people that we recruit into our organization to help them change and adapt as they go through their careers, because I suspect the pace of change over the next 35 years will be much faster than it's been over the past 35, and it's been pretty fast then. If you just look at what's happened over the past 10, it's remarkable. Yes. And I talked to the young people in our organization about what I did when I first joined. We didn't even have a computer in our office. There was one computer at the terminal, and I was running Lotus 1, 2, 3 and entering data <laughs> manually into it. It had to catch up because I could type faster than it could treat the data. That's where we've come from. So the pace of change will continue, and we need as organizations to be able to accompany our staff in that. And the people we're after are people that can adapt to that and that yeah. can find value for us. That's what we're all about. Thank you. The word is adaptability. Go. You need people that are adaptable yeah. because the pace of change is exponential. They need to be adaptable. No, oh, they, they don't run that at my university, the old one. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, can, I make, can I make one final comment on that? Sure. I was also at, at UBC two weeks ago speaking to the, to the new um, uh, set of recruits that have just come out of the geology department. There are people there that are absolutely passionate about rocks. And we want them in our organization too. It's they, and I think the comments have been made, and I think it was Ashok that was making it. The reserves that we find going forward, they'll be found by people. They won't be found by the machines. And so there's, there are places for those individuals in our organization. We want people that are passionate about what they do, whether it's rocks or something else. Massimo, would you repeat the last question? To make sure I'm saying the same thing, right? Well, <laughs> approximately. The question was about um, the pace of the transformation, uh, with some uh, frustrated comments about how slow our industry is in adopting uh, and embracing the opportunities to become more digital. So why are we so slow in proceeding to digital? And which are the barriers that are preventing us to be faster than this? Thank you very much. I, I think to some degree, uh, the gentlemen here have been very helpful in already answering parts of that question, but I think it's also a beautiful uh, departure point for uh, further thinking as we leave. So I will ask all five of you to make a brief statement now that we are approaching the end of this session uh, as your final remarks uh, to the audience. So based on this, how fast do we need to move and why are we not doing it? What are the main barriers? Uh, as a departure point for further thinking as we leave the room. And let's start where we began this morning. John Etkin, please. Okay, so I'm on point. Um, I like the phrase mindset. I think that was already repeated. So I think some of the barrier is simply just a mindset barrier. Um, we've had the luxury in our business of being, actually uh, being takers of price, I think is the word that you would say, right? So the, the price was set by external factors. It was often set in a way that allowed us relatively healthy profits. It allowed us a great deal of inefficiency that we could just tolerate in our system. Those days are probably gone, and certainly as the energy transition place takes place, those days are definitely gone. And so just that mindset of what made our business profitable, I think that 
was a barrier to the pace of change, but I think that's been removed. And so now, now you will see the strong survive and the weak perish, frankly, in this business. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure all of our organizations will thrive, but uh, Thank you know, you for there, that. Will no. be, there will be losers <laughs> in this game. Um, you know, I, I, still, I will still come back to the fact that it's not about removing domain expertise, right? Just, just as my colleagues have represented here. You know, we still need people who understand fundamentally how the earth works. That's not going away. Um, you know, there has been impacts due to the investment climate in our business. Um, and quite frankly, we compete for capital with many other economic opportunities in the planet. And so we have to build a value proposition that attracts capital. And if we can't build it, we can't actually execute at the pace that we would like to. Mr. Bellani. Well, so maybe I'll start off by enthusiastically agreeing with the question that the pace of transformation is uh, very slow. Um, it could be a lot faster, I think. Um, and uh, certainly because the pace of the transformation is slow, it has kind of a, a snowball effect because it uh, decreases our attractiveness to uh, young people who would come in and I agree with Francisco about the fact that some of these digital capabilities, the resource, the human capital available is not that that great, and there are many industries competing for this human capital. So the industry's stance has to be that this industry uh, likes the idea of transforming in this direction, not only likes but is like passionate about it, and if it is not like that, then we would not be able to attract the right people. And the reason for why this space is uh, slow, there are a uh, few reasons. I think at the level of the people who execute, uh, there is still plenty of people don't know what they don't know because uh, the understanding of what the capabilities are is not good enough. Uh, certainly at the level of management or senior levels in the oil and gas companies and the service companies, and I'll just take that as an industry as a whole, there is certainly an issue of not knowing what they don't know. They need to learn about it, get passionate about it, and maybe not learn about it, but to ex accept the idea that this is something that's going to happen and to adopt it and to move with it. You know. Now, this being said, there is also the point that John mentioned about some people who try to protect their jobs uh, and uh, the pace of change gets affected by that. And then, last of all, there is the genuine aspect that when you do adopt these digital tech capabilities, then you do have to change workflows within the industry between companies or business models as well. And that is a genuine aspect of this change which will uh, take a certain period of time and we are a little bit less uh, aggressive on doing those sort of things. But the idea that we don't quite adopt it and ask way too many questions and uh, put a lot of concerns where they don't need to be and that slows down the pace of transformation, this the industry has to get over you know, and get on with it, if you like. So Thank you very I much. I do agree the pace of transformation is slow. So, so to add to that, I suppose we're, we're almost in a catch-22 situation here. So for our projects, they're long lead time projects. They take a while to come to fruition, takes a while to find things, takes a while to get from discovery to, uh, to RFSU. But part of, part of the problem there is the fact that we don't have a collective intelligence. We don't leverage all of the data we have, all of the history we've had, all of the experience we've had. We could make those decisions a lot faster and a lot more wisely, meaning with a great deal more breadth, if we had that collective intelligence and we didn't stick to our deep silos of technical expertise, if we could look across those silos. I mean, wisdom is about breadth and making decisions quickly is what we need to do in our business, but to make them based on data. And that the digital transformation is the leverage to get us to be able to move faster. We need to be able to leverage that, that all of that information that we have from our company's history to, and also all of the things that we can predict with some level of accuracy going forward. So it, it's almost because we don't have that digitisation, we can't go faster. If we had it, we could go faster. So it, it's almost a, a catch-22 situation there, and, and that, that is there 
for a, a, a number of reasons, not least of which is the diversity of, of the community that we have to work with. Different people have different views. Uh, we have some reservations about security, but, but I think um, the sooner you get started, the faster it will progress, uh, and that's where I'd really like to leave it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ochikosa. My conclusion is that the name of the game is definitely efficiency. And, of course, better decisions that will drive more efficiency. And it's the efficiency that will help us all of the industry transition to the low carbon footprint energy. And for doing that, you need people. It's the most important thing. You need to empower your people and you need to bring new talent. And this new talent, the talent pool is very shallow. And you know what? These people, some, most of them, they don't want to, to come and work for us. They want to work for other industries. In the way they see that their talent will be used for this transition to low carbon footprint energy, they will come to us. And according to the pace, there are statistics. Among these, these people, these companies who have already embraced the digital transformation, more than 60% of them, they think the complete digital oil fields automated will be only in five years, five years from now. Thank you. Last word. It's yours. It's very difficult to come after the <laughs> four. <laughs> well... Uh, uh, delivered and eloquent comments to try and sum this up. For me, pace of transformation, why are we slow? I think we are slow. For me, it's all about people and mindsets. Ultimately, it's a business we're in and we need to continue to stay a profitable business. So for me, the digital thing is all about cost and performance and safety and finding value. And I think when I say people and mindsets, what we need to be as we accompany the energy transition, this has not been a panel about the energy transition, and I think that will be much slower than we're talking about in terms of a digital transition, but it's in that context. I think we need to make sure that we're comfortable with being uncomfortable because of the pace of transformation, uh, and we need to be excited about the unknown in front of us because we don't know where it's going, and I think we need to think big even if we start with small steps, the transition will be immense for us. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your participation. Uh, I hope you feel confident that your, uh, your concerns, your questions, your opinions were, uh, let's say, uh, summarized professionally by our two question selectors. Thank you very much, Pierre and Massimo. And gentlemen, I want to thank you on behalf of the audience, on behalf of the conference for wonderful contributions and for your travels, your concerns, your sharing here. Uh, it's been marvelous. Thank you very, very much. Give them a hand, please.